Thank you. Thank you for that generous introduction and for inviting me to this very exciting meeting. I'm sorry we can't all be there to exchange our perspectives on space. Um, it's hard to use spatial terms without punning. So I think I'll share a screen. I have way too much to tell you and I've cut it down, but I'm still telling you way too much. Um, you can stop me with questions. Uh, I'm not finding the PowerPoint. Here it is. Okay. So I assume I'm on screen. Everything's good. Yeah. Okay. This is an example of spatial thinking. Steinberg, one of my favorite visual artists. So all things must move and act in, in space to survive. All living things, again, must move and act in space to survive. Even plants need to move toward the sun, away from the wind. So this is why I claim that all thought begins as spatial thought. I'm, I'm happy to have people uh, contest that view. Um, so spatial, what do I mean by spatial thought? It's moving in space and interacting with the things in space. And it's using, um, in humans, it's thinking how we think about space and how we use think is space to think. And I'll touch on each of those. So spatial thinking is the foundation of thought, not the entire edifice, but the foundation. Some of the evidence comes from work that won the Nobel Prize, I think in 2014, by the Mosiers working in John O'Keefe's lab at UCL. And they, John O'Keefe's group had already found cells in hippocampus that respond when the rat or other um, mammal wanders freely. There are cells in hippocampus that fire whenever the animal is in a particular place. The firing is indicated by the red on the neural network. And these place cells gather information from all over the cortex into a single cell. It's in my mind quite remarkable. So it's information about sight, about smell, about reinforcement history, I think about the motion of the rat. Um, and in fact, these place cells are established by motion. But in hippocampus, the place cells aren't arrayed spatially. And this was a mystery for a long time, in spite of the fact that O'Keefe and Nadell, Nadell called their book, The Hippocampus is a Cognitive Map. It, there was no map there. And the map was discovered by the, the Mosher's working in O'Keefe's lab, grid cells, one synapse away in entorhinal cortex. And you can see the firing pattern in, on the right in the grid cells, and it's hexagonal approximate spatial array. Um, so that was terribly exciting, finding that work. And what made it even more exciting to me in human beings is very recent work sh showing that the same brain structures, hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, that represent places in spatial relations also represent events in time, people, and ideas in temporal, social, and conceptual spaces. So that again is, is quite strong evidence, I think, for the spatial foundation of abstract thought. So the, the metaphor I've used or the analogy I've used is that the hippocampus creates checkers for ideas and the grid cells are like a checkerboard, only they're representing the relations among ideas. So people like most creatures uh, or most um, animate creatures move from place to place in the world. And as they move, as we move, we leave traces on the ground and in the brain, creating paths and places. 
And the hippocampus also records roots, strings of places and paths. And you can think of um, a minimal thought or a minimal diagram as a line linking two points, two ideas by a relationship, two places by the path between them. And you can string together, concatenate these uh, networks into paths in the world. Um, social networks, this is a social network drawn by one of our participants. Um, a phylogenetic trees, family trees. Uh, this is from the Museum of Modern Art illustrating the major art movements in the early part of the 20th century. So we have networks representing just a huge variety of things. Again, they're ideas linked by relations. So thought comes from actions in space. Our feet go from place to place along paths, just as our minds go from thought to thought along conceptual relations. But our hands do something else. Human beings have, have very active hands, very skillful hands. They do huge numbers of different things. And our hands act on things, just as our mind acts on ideas. Um, so paths create spatial schemas for thoughts, dots, lines, networks we talked about. They can inscribe boxes or areas. They can go in circles, spirals, zigzags. Um, and these lines that are created in the ground, you can take different perspectives on. We'll come back to that. So the, the first part of the talk will be putting the world in the mind. How does the mind represent the different spaces that we inhabit? The second part will be using the world, how the mind is put into the world. Um, is something probably, well, not completely uniquely human, but it certainly blossomed in humanity. So the major way, the major spaces that we need to represent to function in the world are the space of the body per se, the space around the body and reach of hand or eye, and the larger space of exploration that we navigate um, and that has to be put together from different views or different experiences, often different kinds of experiences. And each of these spaces are represent, the representations of each of these spaces are distorted by perception and action, and these are intertwined. So I'm gonna go really briefly on the ways that these spaces are distorted. I won't give you all the evidence. Um, there is evidence. So then there are the spaces that we create, putting the mind in the world, maps and other visualization, social spaces to accomplish the different tasks we do together. We make sketches for design and we create large urban spaces. There's a whole lot to be said about that and not nearly enough time. So when thoughts overwhelm the mind, the mind puts thought into the world. Again, something slightly uniquely human. And putting the mind, we can put the mind in the, in the world using words, as I'm doing now, using gestures, as I'm doing at this moment. It's hard to do on Zoom. Um, and using graphics of various kinds. I'll concentrate a little bit I'll only say a little bit about words, but concentrate on gestures and graphics, which have a way of representing and communicating information that's very different from the way language does it. So these are cognitive tools to augment thought, communicate thought. So cognitive tools expand the mind. They offload memory and information processing, enlarging the mind hugely. They use space to represent literal and metaphoric space and action. Because they're in front of the eyes and can be inspected and aren't overloading working memory, they promote inference and discovery. Because they're public, they allow creation, revision, and inference. 
by a community. And again, I think I say this as a challenge that, in, that they're uniquely human. Nobody has ever seen a gorilla draw a map in the air or in the sand. So here we're going on language, um, actions and ideas uh, are like actions on objects. We raise ideas, we pull them together, we tear them apart, we turn them upside down, we toss them around, we line them up. And we say that in language and many times we gesture indicating those sorts of actions. So, but their actions on ideas, there's no object there. That's what makes them gestures. So space has meaning. Uh, a proximity in space indicates proximity on any dimension. The vertical dimension is loaded because of gravity. Going up takes resources, um, health, wealth, uh, and, and strength. So everything good goes up in general. Uh, the horizontal is pretty much neutral, but it's affected by cultural, um, cultural factors, in particular reading order. And there's a whole cottage industry looking at the effects of cultural reading order on cognition. Very interesting um, and perhaps surprising um, set of findings. And a handedness has some sort of effect as well. Uh, left-handed people tend to indicate value with their left hand. Right-handed people tend to indicate valuable things on their, with their right hands. But the, the effect of handedness is limited and limited probably to value. Um, okay, so space has meaning. We also have figurative spaces. Again, they're spatial. We say we're out of depth. We say somebody's at the top of the class or feeling up. Somebody fell in a depression. We got closer, thinking out of the box. Again, there are these figurative spaces for thoughts and we have them in language and in gesture. I'm gonna skip that. So space, now I'm gonna go back to the spaces that we inhabit. Space is special, it's supramodal, not just, we know about space, not just from vision. Blind people can have very good senses of space and use, blind people use gesture without ever having seen it. Um, so the, their gestures are for their own thinking. We know about space, not just from vision. We know about it from hearing, from smell. Blind people use the texture under their feet, sounds, um, so that in many of these, we might not be consciously aware of, but they're all important in navigation and important in other spatial tasks. Uh, and, um, the, the, so that each of these modalities contributes, they contribute unique things, but they're overlapping and can be used to, to uh, orient ourselves in space. Space is essential to survival. If we didn't know how to get home at night or food in our mouths, we'd be in real trouble. As I've indicated, space, spatial knowledge is the basis for other knowledge. Our knowledge of space isn't like geometry or physical measurement. We don't have those measuring instruments in our head. It's again comes from perception and action and it's there are systematic distortions due to perception and action. So let's start with the space around the body and bodies are experienced from the inside as well as the outside, unlike objects. From the outside, we have information, the same information we have for objects, perceptual information primarily, and contour, the borders of objects are particularly important in recognizing them. Um, insider information is can come from is kinesthetic proprioceptive. It's um, especially important in function in what bodies can do, and the, the our the functional importance isn't correlated with body size. It is correlated with how large 
Um, the different parts of the body appear in kids' drawings. The, these are drawings that kids make all over the world, although usually they have two legs, not one, but the head is enlarged, the hands are enlarged, and the legs and back are smaller. And this is similar to our cortical representations of bodies, where again, the hands, the head, um, and other organs are relatively large, legs uh, and back relatively small. We did a series of tasks uh, uh, that queried how people judge um, parts of the body and their judgments, reaction times to, to um, name or identify different parts of the body, functional importance ratings and so forth, all correlate with function as indicated on the um, homunculus um, rather than with size. So size of a body is less important than functional significance in our representations of the body. This is what we would look like if size were correlated with, with, if actual size was correlated with cortical size. So that's the body, the space of around the body. Um, we can think of in terms of the major axes of the body, the head foot axis, the, the front back axis, the left right axis, and also gravity, the relationship of the body to the world. And we did a large set of studies looking at how people keep track of the things immediately around the body as they navigate space and found that the, um, the axis that was fastest, most accessible is the head foot axis, both because it's asymmetric and correlated with gravity. The next fastest axis was the front back. Uh, our perceptual and motor um, apparati are oriented frontwards, not backwards. And uh, so the asymmetries are extremely important. And that's the next fastest axis, uh, axis for accessing things around it or keeping track of things around it. And the left right has asymmetries, but they're far less salient and important. And that ends up being or, or discernible. And that ends up being the least, the, the worst or slowest axis for keeping track of things around us. And in fact, many people confuse left and right and there are cultures, there are language cultures that don't distinguish left and right, a longer story. Um, so bodies live in the world. And now we get to the world of exploration, which is the world that's too large to see from a single point. And it's put together from many sources, not just actually experiencing the world, but from maps of the world, descriptions of the world, and how we integrate those different sources is a real challenge, both for people and for models. So there are a number of distortions. Some are, the, the first ones are research of other people. It's um, uh, uh, an interesting distortion of hierarchical grouping of space. So even though space is flat, we group it hierarchically. We don't remember the directions amongst all the cities in the world. Instead, we use the higher order um, um, elements to, to as acute to where the, the cities are. So in America, we use states to infer lo locations of cities. And students in San Diego, here at the bottom, almost on the Mexican border, were asked, what's the direction between San Diego and Reno? And most of them put, it, put Reno east of San Diego instead of west of San Diego, as is the case. And that's presumably because people know that Reno is in Nevada, San Diego is in California, and on the whole, California is west of Nevada. So they use 
the, the orientations of the states to infer the orientations of the city. So once this study was done, everybody did it in their own state or country and a hierarchical organization distorts not just directions, but distances. And so it's a strong effect and, and that doesn't correspond to reality. Another um, distortion is, is Steinberg again caught on to, and that's that we judge distances that are close to us as larger than distances uh, that are far from us. That's again been shown in many, many experiments that the perspective we take um, influences our distant judgment and farther distances get telescoped as if we were on top of a mountain and they seem smaller than the distances close to us. This, these, this distortion also happens in time as does the hierarchical organization. So many of these distortions that I'm describing in space have analogs in time, in social relations, in political judgments and so forth. Again, a bit of evidence that spatial thinking is foundational. So the, we have a major asymmetry in distance estimations. People think that Pierre's house is closer to the Eiffel Tower than the Eiffel Tower to Pierre's house. It's again um, a, a distortion that people have done all over the world on college campuses and in cities picking major landmarks that people know and asking for distances between from an ordinary building to a landmark or from a landmark to an ordinary building. And again, the distance from a landmark is um, to an ordinary building is judged to be smaller than the distance from an ordinary building to a landmark. And landmarks again describe neighborhoods. So they seem to encompass things that are more than they are. People think magenta is, is more similar to red than magenta because red seems to include all reds and magenta only includes itself. So, um, Again, these judgments happen in other areas as well as um, spatial. We looked at a couple of other distortions that are analogous to gestalt grouping effects. People tend to group large bodies together. Uh, so people um, are, it, our participants were more likely to pick the incorrect map of the world, which is the one on the left, than the correct one. And the one on the left, we've moved South America to be slightly more under North America. Um, and this distortion works on blobs that aren't even interpreted as countries. It works on cities. It's, um, it's pretty substantial. Um, another distortion we looked at is uh, one we called rotation. So the Bay Area, which you have depicted in front of you, runs at an angle. And we asked students at Stanford for the direction between Stanford and um, which is sort of down here, Palo Alto and Berkeley, which is up here. And you can see that actually Berkeley is west of, Stan of Stanford, but people tend to line up the Bay Area with the external coordinates. So a ma significant majority of people think that Berkeley is actually east of, um, is west of, of, of Stanford and um, rather than east. And again, we find these distortions with artificial stimuli Italy, the boot of Italy gets straightened out. Japan gets put more horizontal. You can find it everywhere. Okay, so it, it, the perceptual organization factors are we remember shapes as more aligned with each other and we remember shapes as rotated to their reference frames. So cognitive maps seem to be impossible figures. There's no way to put all those errors together in a coherent map and or representation. 
cognitive maps seem to be created on the fly. It's not that we have a file drawer of them and pull them up when we need to make a judgment. We simply take whatever information we have to make that judgment and that information can be approximate and in fact distorted. So cognitive maps are closer to cognitive collages. They're multimodal, incoherent, and maybe more beautiful. So describing space um, needs a perspective. I'm gonna say two words on, on describing space, on language. It's again, something that's been studied quite a bit. Um, and there are seem to be two major ways of describing space. And one is analogous to the way we experience it. It's a route walking through it. Uh, and that perspective has been called root, egocentric, embedded, intrinsic. There are num a number of different names for it. It's been distinguished in linguistics, in geography, in psychology, and with different terms. This is quite common, I find, in research. The other view is more map-like. It's been called survey or allocentric or overview. And we've done a number of studies looking at how people describe space. And they often promiscuously mix the descriptions. They switch perspective without signaling and, and uh, without even really realizing it. And people understand it. So despite the fact that linguists and geographers and even some psychologists prefer a single perspective, people mix them. We'll see in a minute, they mix them in maps as well. Um, so here, this is an overview map of Stanford, an embedded view of Stanford, and a root view, and people switch and mix. Um, as there's another view we can take on perspective, again, I won't have time to talk too much about it, and that's when I'm talking to you or when I'm talking to somebody else, but looking at uh, a third person, um, we have a choice of perspective. Should we use our own or somebody else's, the person we're talking to? In general, when that person is in the conversation, we use their perspective, not our own. It's not just politeness because um, it, it's, we did a series of experiments on that. It has to do with relative cognitive load. If I'm telling you something, your cognitive load is higher. You have to understand me. I know what I'm talking about, presumably. And so it's easier for me to take your perspective than for you to take mine. An interesting case is when both of us are looking at Patrick here, and he's reaching for a book. And we ask people, with respect to the bottle, the water bottle, where is the book? Now, you and I are talking together. From our perspective, the book is on the right. From Patrick's perspective, the book is on the left. When Patrick is reaching, is performing an action, we, talking to each other, facing Patrick, take his perspective. So this was surprising to us and to various other people who replicated that, that it's easier to take the other person's perspective than our own when action is involved. And I think it's a way of understanding the action is by taking the other's perspective. So that's a couple of words on perspective. Um, let me switch now, and I know I'm throwing a huge amount at you, to go back to graphics and gesture, ways of externalizing thought. And they seem to have a very different semantic syntax and pragmatics from language. They do seem to have their own semantic syntax and pragmatics. It's looser. Than, than syntax, semantics, and pragmatics in language, but it's a more direct route to meaning using elements or, and spatial relations in the case of, uh, in both cases. Again, a longer story, and I'll only tell you part of it. I'd like to show you now 
some videos of people thinking. So these are people alone in a room. They're reading very complicated um, descriptions and they're going to be tested. So a, one set of descriptions were describing environments that either had four or eight landmarks. We wrote the descriptions either from a survey perspective or a root perspective, and the questions came from both perspectives. So this is part of a description. Edna is a charming town nestled in an attractive highway, entered on River Highway. River Highway runs east-west at the southern edge of Etna toward the eastern border, River Highway intersects with Mountain Road, which runs north of it, and so on. It will locate the four or eight landmarks. And I'll show you someone who's reading this. Again, alone in the room, the door is closed. Um, and the instructions told her to learn it for a test. They said nothing about gesturing. So, oh. So watch her hands. She's not watching her hands. She's essentially drawing a map. She's making a diagram on the table with paths for the streets and dots for the, the landmarks. And she's often repeating it, re rehearsing with her hands and when I watch her and our other participants, we've run hundreds by now, I get the feeling that their hands are translating the language into thought. You saw that the language is hard. So 70% of our participants do this at least once. They, re they read four descriptions. They um, perform better on the descriptions that they gesture on. And if we take another group of participants and make them sit in their hands, they perform worse. And some of them say, I can't think without my hands. So let me, this person, next person is um, reading a description of how a car brake works. It's again, quite difficult. I won't test you or even read it. Let me show you him. So he's going to do that again, bigger. So again, he's rehearsing it. He's looking very carefully at the language, translating the language into actions of, that's not a gesture, translating the language into the actions of, of his body and not looking at his body. He's looking at the screen. Okay, one more. This is a woman a, reading a description of parallel events in time. She's essentially gonna form a matrix on the top of the desk. She does look at her hands, but that's unusual. Oh, sorry. There. So some people draw matrices on the top of the desk or in the air. Some people use the knuckles of their hands as a matrix and put things there. So people model what they're reading differently, but they all model. They're creating these structures in space. We call them visual motor or spatial motor. They aren't visual. Um, blind people gesture, as I said, we, we were planning to do these same studies on blind participants, but the, the graduate student took a computer with all the descriptions, went off to run the blind, and I haven't seen her since. So um, it, those data are still in the air, and I hope someone does it. So the gestures model the situation in the text. The models are spatial motor, not visual. Preventing gesture reduces comprehension. And again, I think gesture translates language into thought. Gestures also promote collaboration. These two people are trying to find a, a route after an earthquake to rescue people when roads are blocked off and they're negotiating it. And, you can see they're not looking at each other. 
They're only um, looking at their gestures on the map. First we can, yeah, and they, like this. You, you can see sometimes they like to get into the, um, it, it, they take turns, oh, but sometimes the they're anxiously right? waiting Sorry. to get in there. And when they can gesture at, at the, uh, over the same map, they're much happier with the collaboration than when a shower curtain intervenes between them so they can speak clearly, but they can't gesture on the same map. The gestures are far more precise than the words. Um, the, in fact, the people who can't gesture on the same maps have to rely on spatial description. Their maps differ 30% of the time. Okay. So uh, talking about nonverbal communication that's very quick, spatial communication that's very quick. In basketball games, it's high, people have to somehow communicate to their teammates, bluff the people on the opposite team, manage the ball, follow the ball, shoot for it, all in rapid fire succession, and it's all implicit. Okay, uh, gestures for others, and I'm gonna quickly go through this because I've already overloaded you. I showed that gestures are important for our own thinking, um, but they're also important for others. We studied this in a situation where people watched a video of an explanation of how a gen gen engine works, um, half saw action gestures, half saw structure gestures, then they were given true fa false tests of both structure and action. And the most interesting data were visual explanations of how the engine worked and videoed explanations of how the engine worked. So remember half saw gestures that indicated action, like the combustion of the engine or the carburetor goes up and down and the half saw gestures that indicated the shape of the carburetor or the shape of the engine. So they were structure gestures. So I'm not gonna show you those videos. Okay. I'm gonna go this small. right to the um, results. So viewing action gestures, um, made it enabled the participants to answer more actions correctly. The actions could be answered on the basis of the script. You didn't need the gestures to answer the questions. Nevertheless, people who saw action gestures answered more action questions correctly. There was no difference for the structure gestures because structure is easy for people. Action is hard. Notably, there was more action expressed in the visual explanations. There were more gestures, action gestures, in the, in the videoed explanations. The gestures were invented. They weren't imitated. And there were so that they saw the same number of gestures, but um, invented extra ones to express um, actions. The, the people who saw actions also used more action words in their, um, in their explanations. And they didn't hear more action words, but they described it with more action words. So I'm gonna show you a couple of their visual explanations. This is someone who saw structure gestures, another person who saw structure gestures. Here's someone who saw action gestures. And we counted the number of error, arrows, many more in the people who saw action gestures. We counted these explosions and the bubbles and the carburetor, the action elements, many more in those who saw action gestures. So seeing action gestures, um, it gave people a far deeper understanding of the action than seeing structured gestures. The action gestures communicated a, a huge amount of information. They internalized the action from seeing the action gestures. Another person who saw action gestures. So we found similar results asking people to make it, it learn 
they learned how um, chemical bonding went, and then they were asked to either make a verbal explanation of chemical bonding or of uh, a visual explanation. These are some of the visual explanations. So they're, they're very different. They aren't the sorts of things they saw in the unit. The people who made visual explanations performed far better on the test than the people that, that made verbal explanation. Another visual explanation, verbal explanation. It's just one word after another. So it, this is a medium not used, usually used in teaching. The, the, the visual explanations also help teachers. They help teachers know what are the misconceptions of the students. And I think it's something that can be used for lots of different content, not just chemistry. So why are the visual explanations better? They're a natural mapping of meaning to space. They abstract the essentials, so do words, but I think visual explanations force you to do it more. We did find more of the critical functional and action information represented in the visual explanations than in the verbal ones. Importantly, the visual explanations give you a check for completeness. Is everything I need there? They also give you a check for coherence. Does it make sense? Have I described, have I visualized the processes appropriately or inappropriately? So is, is my explanation complete? Is it coherent? Making it visual gives me, creates a model and lets me check for completeness and coherence. It also provides a platform for inferring function from structure. Okay. So good graphics abstract. They distort, um, they omit a lot of information and they add information in particular multimodal information and symbolic information. On the whole, they don't add sentences. They add words and symbols here and there. But they do distort as the famous London um, tube map, um, which is a classic in graphic design. By the way, the designer who was doing this had just finished um, doing designs of circuit diagrams. And I think that influenced the way he visualized the two. Um, so ingredients of graphics are spatial relations and marks. And as I said, I think these can convey meaning directly. We've already done that. The marks and elements can be iconic. They can rep iconic in a different sense than the philosophical. They can resemble what they're representing. They can have figurative relations to what they're representing like scales of justice. They can be schematic like a dot in a, net, in a network. They can be symbolic like words or plus and, and equal signs. Um, meaningful schematic marks can be points and lines um, forming networks. Arrows, we have a whole set of research on how arrows convey meaning, boxes or, or containers. And again, there are parallels in gesture. So now I'm going to jump to ancient graphics, and I'm really almost done. Um, so it, this is a, and people made graphic representations all over the world. More and more are being found each day and are extremely exciting. We're not the only species that, that left graphic marks where they could be seen by future generations. Neanderthals um, apparently did, although no one's yet found representative. Uh, marks by Neanderthals, they may. So this is the previous old, oldest map when there was written writing. You can see that it mixes perspective, has an overview of the paths and frontal views of the, um, of the landmarks. It's in stone, which is probably why it survives 6,000 years. This one also stone. It's two inches by one inch, 
It's a very small stone, it was found in a cave in Spain probably 10 years ago. It's 14,000 years old. And the inscription on it is the area surrounding the cave where the stone was found. So it was portable. Maybe people took it on their way to know how to come back. Can you imagine the excitement of the archaeologist who walked into a cave, picked up an innocuous looking stone and saw that it represented the environment around it? I mean, that's a thrill of a lifetime. Um, other kinds of maps, coastal Eskimos, again, this is preliterate, use these carved pieces of wood to negotiate the coastline of Greenland. The coastline is, is carved into these um, pieces of wood. They're small, they fit inside a mitten. They're very cold. They're, I mean, it's a cold area. They're explored tactically, manually. And if they fall in the water, they float. Another kind of map, South Sea Islanders use these maps. The bamboos to, to go in the ocean, um, the open ocean thousands of miles with the help of stars and training. Um, the bamboo strips are the ocean currents. You can recognize them by the flotsam and jetsam on the surface of the sea. Um, ocean, the currents are like the highways of the ocean. They're the paths that take you easily from island to island. The islands are indicated by those shells. And you can't see one island from the other. So it, it must have been pretty scary getting in a boat, going on the open ocean to an unseen place. At least some of them came home. Um, so again, this, this is a, a valley in, in Italy, Bedellino, that has many of these petroglyphs. This is a drawing of a petroglyph. Again, you can see two perspectives going back 4,000 years. Um, these sorts of petroglyphs are uh, again inscribed in rocks all over the world. Uh, another way of indicating a map is holding up your hand and uh, North Coast in Indians in the United States use this to show the locations of various cities around them. Um, so we have maps. We also have uh, ancient representations of time. This looks like a stampede. It's from Chauvet Cave uh, going back uh, 33,000 years. There were even older cave drawings. I think there were some found 40, 45,000 years now in, in Sulawesi in Indonesia, um, which are quite depicting animals. They're again, quite beautiful. This is from the United States. It's called Newspaper Rock, petroglyphs that told the news of the day. The events. So again, we have a stampede. We have people with bows and arrows. The, this could be anywhere. The same sort of drawings could be have been found anywhere in the world. Um, more on time events. This is making bread, Egyptian tomb, far later in civilization, but it's showing step by step from sowing wheat to um, baking the loaves, uh, and it's in a tomb. Um, this, it, 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 this is particularly exciting. This is a petroglyph that was found in Kashmir. It goes back 4,000 years, and you see on the left the, pet, the stone, on the right the drawing from the stone. You can see a man with a bow and arrow, a horned creature, and another man pointing upwards. And he's pointing upwards to what looks like two suns. So an astronomer, an Indian astronomer, determined that from the age of the rock, which could be determined, that, that 4,000 years ago then, there was a supernova. So again, can you imagine the excitement of seeing a supernova in the brightness of day, two suns suddenly? And that is single event was striking enough that it was inscribed in a stone. So we've got space, we've got time, um, more time, more time. Calendars, 
sometimes circular, sometimes tabular. Um, we find people representing time on lines, again, a longer story. So we, space, time, number. These again go back, these are uh, 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 stone, um, also on bones, some sort of tally, we don't know what for, going back 70 to 100,000 years, but tallies again are found all over the world. They're very primitive representations of number, one-to-one -one correspondences, which is what babies get quite early, and number names and number sim symbols took a long time for civilization to develop. And there are still cultures uh, uh, that thrive today with no number words. And it, it, I asked, what, what will, how will they answer if you ask them how many children they have? And I was told they would give the list of names of their children. They don't use their hands and they don't count past three. Okay, more tallies, other ways of representing number. We just use our fingers, but there are the cultures that use other parts of their body can come far harder, higher with their body than we can. Abacuses. So ancient graphics show people, animals, things. They show place and space. They show time and events. They show number. And there are, for many of these, dedicated places in the brain for representing these things. So in certainly in names, not for numbers, but one-to-one -one correspondences. Um, so that these are important things in our lives. And in fact, if you look at contemporary uh, newspapers and so forth, the, the graphics will be often people, things, animals, place, space, time, events, and number. So ancient graphics are quite similar to modern ones. So clear graphics are great for clear thinking and, and clear guidance, messy for discovery. So this, this is actually clear for discovery, but was used for inference. The cholera epidemic in the early 1800s in London before the germ theory of disease. And the, the city official, John Snow, asked people to make a map of the cholera cases. They clustered around the Broad Street pump. And he said, without knowing, anything about how disease is transmitted, but on a hunch had them remove the handle from the pump and the, the um, epidemic abated. It would be wonderful if, if COVID had abated so easily. Um, spatial patterns afford conceptual inferences. Archaeologists can use site maps to infer the organization of society. Was it hierarchical? Um, are there big houses and small houses? Are there special purpose houses or just dwellings? So they can tell a great deal about the society, the culture, the economics, just from the spatial patterns. This is another set of inferences, World War II. Um, there were bombers going um, from England uh, to bomb uh, sites in Germany. Some were coming back, some were not coming back. The question, there was a bit of money to reinforce the bombers. So where do you reinforce? And Wald had people make a diagram with a black mark for the um, bombers that returned. So that's the one on the right. And where you reinforce? in those white places where the bombers didn't return, okay? And of course, that's where the pilot and the co-pilot were. Uh, this, here are some cases for, um, that are more concerned with art and design where uh, ambiguity is important. You don't, want, um, you don't want clear diagrams or architects don't want clear diagrams of what they're designing. They don't like, CAD CAM programs because they make everything too or ordered. Instead, they make sketches 
and their sketches, they look at their sketches, they make the sketches for one reason, they look at their sketches and they get new ideas from the sketches. So beginning architects can see this pattern here and say that I can use that triangle, elongated triangle as a motif and I can use it um, repeatedly. They didn't intend that, but they see it when they look, but it's in the diagram. And novices can see things in the diagram, whether they're musicians or chess players, they can see things that are in the diagram. Seeing things that aren't in the diagram, extrapolating from it takes expertise in music and chess and in design. So experienced architects can see that traffic is gonna be a mess or they can see the light is gonna fall badly in the winter. But it's the ambiguity that allows the reinterpretation. Again, we've brought that into the lab. Um, so it promotes creativity. It works in artists, a, a, uh, an artist who is, is, does beautiful work did a dissertation partly with me studying other artists whose practice is drawing. She studied a great many of them and again videotaped them as they drew and asked them to what they were thinking about afterward. She also coded how they drew, which was ex turned out to be extremely interesting in terms of style and characterizing each of them. Um, but the artists say they explore. It's a safe place to explore. They deliberately make mistakes and they make discoveries. They draw for one instance and they see other things. They say that the sketch talks to me, the ideas emerge from the page and they talk about it as a conversation between the eye, the hand and the page. And if they talk, it interferes, language gets in the way. So this is extremely intelligent but nonverbal. And I think musicians will say the same, architects say the same. They're having this kind of conversation between what their hands do or what their mouth does if they're playing clarinet um, and what they create in the world and then back again. And that guides their creativity. Okay, this is the world as nature gave us, minus the concrete. This is the world that we create. We make order in the world. We make categories, hierarchies, and orders in our bookshelves. We line up books by size or topic. Um, the same thing happens in a supermarket. We put things in categories and subcategories on our shelves. Um, we also organize by themes, and we can see that in our houses. We put everything that has to do with cooking and eating in the kitchen. They come from different categories. I'm not finding the kitchen. Um, I guess that's the kitchen. And everything to do with cleaning in the bathroom, again, coming from different categories. For leisure in the living room, again, different categories. So we also organize by themes around things that areas or, or that serve the same function. So other ways we put our mind in the world, we make one-to-one -one correspondences, repetitions, cycles, embeddings in our place settings, in our buildings. We have a balcony for each room and each apartment, and then presumably each apartment has the same set of things in it. Um, we do these organizations of rows and columns and categories and themes in the three-dimensional world. And imagine, I mean, just think how different our world is from the world of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, where most of the world was the world that nature gave us and not the world we designed and how much the design world communicates to us, tells us what kind of building this is, how to find our way within a building, 
what a set table means as opposed to a pile of dishes somewhere and so forth. So babies growing up in this designed world receive a great deal of intelligence from this designed world. We then use the designs that we create deliberately to create diagrams like the periodic table, timetables, um, bar graphs. This is the likelihood of a computer issue being solved by reconfiguring, re-imaging, antivirus, uninstalling, uh, or turning it on and off. And this is how long it took me to draw and color each of these bars. Um, so if we use those organizations to organize knowledge and communicate it deliberately. So I've, um, I've developed a term, it's a Latinate word and Latinate words in English are ugly. Sorry for that. If someone comes up with a better one, I'll be really happy. It's a contraction of space, action and abstraction. And the concept is that actions in space create abstractions. The actions on objects in space get turned into gestures on thoughts in our mind. And the abstractions that we create in space, the rows and columns and one-to-one -one correspondences get turned into diagrams that we use to communicate abstractions. And then we go one step further we diagram the world. So this is an airport from the top. It says where the service trucks can go, where the buses carrying people can go, where the planes can go, where they must stop. Every inch of the, of the ground of an airport is diagrammed that, and it controls the behavior of all the things moving on it. Um, and we're, we're not allowed there. We would mess everything up, but we are allowed here. And again, our world is diagrammed. It tells where bikes can go, where buses can go, where cars can go, what direction cars can go, where they can park, where they must stop, when they must go, where they can turn, where they can't turn, where people can walk and so forth. And these are there to enable behavior and to control behavior, organize our behavior. So we've not only designed the world, we've diagrammed it. And that these, that's my end. And I'm open for questions or comments and apologies for throwing too much at you. <laughs>